Well, if you haven't been with us, just a quick recap. Uh, we have been going through the book of Acts, which is just the actions of the early church from the time that Christ gave us our mission to going out into the world. And through that, we are finding principles and truths and examples and the way they learn things hard, the way things they learn things right, of ways to be able to do that ourselves because we have the same mission if you've won who have accepted Jesus as a leader and forgiver in your own life. We are all on mission. We are all missionaries. So with that, uh, let's talk about the mission because that's always got to be laid out at the beginning so we're all on the same page on that. But Jesus has called us to do, do one. Come on, not rhetorical. Huh? Go, but lead people to Jesus. I'll give you the first one. Get to the ballpark. Second one. Oh, my gosh. Okay, back to Acts 1. No. <laughs> huh? What comes after leading people to the Lord? No. You guys are killing me. Listen, son, seriously, they are smarter than this, I promise. Dad's already gone back here and named them all, and he's, like, judging you severely. Lead people to the Lord, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to teach each other to obey everything he's commanded of us. Lead people to the Lord, baptize, and disciple one another, right? Yeah. This is for our guess. I mean, this is like three years of stuff we've been talking about. <sighs> but they can tell you to check in, show out, and fill out the communication card. Okay, so anyways, that's our mission. Then he tells them where to do it. Let's see if you guys are any better at this. Ready? First place they go? Judea. No, Jerusalem, which is their hometown. Next one? Judea, Judea which is their country. Next one? Samaria, which are people that are different than you because there's no room for prejudice in the body of Christ. And the last one? Whole world. Whole world. There you go. Now you guys have redeemed yourselves. At least three of you have. Okay. <laughs> Whew. So when we've been going through Acts, the church, when it first starts, first off, it gives them this incredible mission. It says, do not do it without the Holy Spirit. So they have to wait 10 days. They go, they go into an upper room and they pray and they get into the scripture and the talking scripture. Uh, they are in unity with one another. This is important to know because this is the things that really lets the door open for the Holy Spirit. And they worship. They put God first. And then when the Holy Spirit comes and fills them, they go out and they reach their hometown. There's a little bit of outside the hometown, but 95% of it, for everything we've been talking about for the last two months, is how to reach people within your hometown. People you know, people that you're familiar with, you understand the culture, you understand where everything is. It, 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 it's the first step. That you're getting outside your comfort zone because you're ministering, but it's not gotten wacky yet. Last week, things exploded, and now they're going to literally, the exact same word Jesus says, it says in chapter 8 that they go out to Judea and Samaria because they're persecuted when Stephen is martyred. Stephen, the first person killed for the faith, he was a deacon who kept you know, telling people about Jesus, and they got mad and they killed him. And so everybody's now scattered out. So that's where we're going to pick things up. We're now moving into outside of our comfort zones of our hometown. So if you would, let's, if I haven't told you yet, we'll go to Acts 8. It's going to pick things up today, Acts 8. If you need a Bible, there's Bibles in the baskets underneath the chairs around the room that you can keep borrowed still. Uh, or you can use Uversion, which is a national free app, and sign on to our, uh, web, web, uh, our Internet here with the Password Fellowship, and you can follow along there. But we're going to continue after Stephen's death and they're now moving out, what it looks like when we're getting outside of our hometown into, for us, our state, our country, and with people of different cultures, people of different backgrounds than what we have, even within our own community. Sound good? So it's getting outside of that comfort zone. We've kind of had that big moment where we recapped everything with home. Now we're moving out. Uh, so now that this persecution has happened, and these people are going to Jerusalem, they're going to Samaria, chapter, verse 4 of chapter 8 tells us that what they're doing, they're going and preaching the word to be able to do what Christ has called them to do. We're going to pick up with a guy named Philip. Uh, Philip, we're going to get two weeks with Philip. Uh, we've already had his origin story. He was mentioned with Stephen and the other seven that were uh, selected to be the deacons when the people were not, when the widows were not all getting fed and they wanted people selectively over taking care of that need. Uh, Stephen was first, the one who was killed, and then Philip was second. That's who we're going to come across uh, his stories and his adventures. So, Read a little, talk a little. Let's see what you find. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits crying out in a loud voice came out of many who had them, 
and many of them were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in the city. So Philip, like Stephen, is now moving past that deacon wall, right? He's now going out to an evangelist. If you were around, I think it was just about a year ago, we were going through the different spiritual gifts. And when we did evangelism, we did uh, Philip and talked about his evangelism. Uh, actually, the same section we're going to be looking at next week from a different scope. So he has now moved out because of his persecution, and he's doing the ministry. So he's kind of passed out forward like Stephen, but he also has passed forward like Jesus did. Because Jesus is the other great example we have of going to Samaria. Because nobody went to Samaria if you were a good Jew. Not this culture, not this time. Jew Jewish people, there was a lot of prejudice and racism against Samaritan people. <clears throat> for a few reasons. Uh, one I always share with, and I'll use the same example I usually do. They were half-breeds. It's basically how they were looked upon. They were half-Jewish, half-Gentile. And if you're a Jewish person, you have great pride in your Jewishness. You are 100% Jewish. Um, the, the example I always use, now see if I mess it up. I, I think I got it down this time. But if you ever watch Harry Potter, because why would anybody read Harry Potter? If, the, many of books have ruined great movies. That's how I put it. When you read, yeah, the movie's always better. Hey, did I say it once we talk at this point? What's going on? We're very proud. We're very proud. <laughs> but if you have experience with Harry Potter, and whether it be the good way or the whatever, um, they're, they're the, 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 the people that are half human, half wizards, right? They, they get looked at. It's not, is it mudbloods? Yeah. Okay, I always say muggles, and muggles are the humans. Okay. Maybe I need to read the books. Listen, after this, I get to have lunch with my family, so you guys are lucky I'm here. I'm just saying, don't push me. Okay, but that, that's the kind of prejudice that was there. Uh, so the, the, the good Jewish people really didn't want anything to do with Samaritans. Uh, that's why it was so amazing that Jesus went there. And on top of that, Jesus talked to a woman instead of a man. And on top of that, he talked to a woman who the entire town themselves didn't like because she was such a sinner that even the mudbloods didn't like her. So... Uh, so now we see Philip moving into the, this, the same gauge of things. And uh, the other thing that was there that I've never really talked about too much, and I'm kind of learning more myself in this area, is the, the Samaritans, because they're half Jewish and half Gentile, they have their own version of Judaism. And so that's looked down upon as well. If you look at your Bible, right, you got the Old Testament, that's a good 70% of the book, right? Uh, that was the Bible of that day that the Jewish people follow is the Old, Old Testament. If anybody ever tries to tell you that the Bible's been written within the last couple hundred years or that it was slapped together by guys with an agenda, that's crap. Everybody in Jesus' day and the early church and all the way through had the Old Testament. It is quoted multiple times in the New Testament because this is their Bible. and People had access to it through the synagogue. So it's not, it, it's something that was there for 4,000 years before Jesus took and became a baby. Okay, so, so, but with the Samaritans, they only accepted the first five. The first five, which is what Moses wrote. And they ignored the rest of it because they had a different view of what the Messiah was going to be. They had a different view of what the prophecies would be. So that gave them a different Judaism than what the Jews thought was pure. And so that caused conflict as well. And anytime you have a place where there's some truth and not all truth, they need Jesus there. The word needs to come. So Philip is going into this place to do this. Now, what I want to look at you with, and uh, God loved Lisa and God loved Chris. I was thinking about this as this week. If you think it's hard to follow me when I'm talking up here, imagine being the people trying to figure out where I'm at in the PowerPoint. So Lisa and Chris, thank you for all your hard work, but Lisa, we will go to that first slide. Boom! There it is. And when I put up on slides, usually that means it's good bullet points for those who are taking notes. Then I'm going to work around that. So for note takers, now that we're back in the parks, people are getting back in there. Good job. But here's the things that, I, that I'm going to notice when Philip goes into this town. And this is a model, I think, that we can embrace and learn more about when it comes to us taking to a ministry outside of our comfort zone of just people we're comfortable with. First off was the message. His message was the good news of Jesus Christ. Okay, that, that, that was his full focus. Everything is, is completely guided by and dictated to him by the message that he's bringing to it. So if you write down notes, that, that was, that's Philip's approach. This is what our approach should be. The next part is the signs that he brought with him. The miracles, the casting out of demons, there's all kinds of signs that says God is here. It doesn't just have to be those two, but those are the two that are there. That was very much like Pentecost light, now they're taking Jerusalem out into uh, Samaria. 
And so there's always some kind of tangible on how a message is legit. Your sign could be helping someone move when nobody else wants to help them move. Your sign could be helping somebody with food when they don't have any food. Your sign could be anything that is a sacrifice to you that shows Jesus that there's something different about you. There's signs that go with that message to prove that message. The other thing he has is he has his uniqueness leveled. And this is really when you start getting out of your hometown, your uniqueness leveled. Um, when you go outside of the comfort zone that you have, you're going to be different. Okay, it's just the way it is. You go to Tennessee in the Smoky Mountains, you're different. You go do some work in the Appalachian Mountains, and you were born with a silver spoon in your, your mouth, you're different. Okay, no matter where we go outside of our zone, you are different, and that's a good thing. Because you, like, our finances, our resources, our spiritual gifts, our talents, our experiences, our knowledge... It's another resource that we have that God's entrusted us with to be a good steward of, to be able to invest into the lives of others. So when you go into places and they say, you're real, to say, God willing, I am. Okay, I watch the movies, not the books. No, wait, you guys are the weird ones. Okay, so use that uniqueness for the Lord. Talk to some, some, some book readers need Jesus, so you guys can go reach them. Um, for me, the examples I, I thought of uh, are most easily gauged in the next level of going out into the world. So I'm going to use them, but I am going to come back and use an example that fits Samaria. Uh, when I was in Thailand, it stuck out like a, like a, a whatever, a weirdo, so thumbs. Really? That doesn't sound right. Okay. Um, and people ask why you're there. And it, thankfully, it was a country that likes Americans. So they want to know more about you. They don't want to kill you. So that's a good thing. And so you could say, well, I'm here because of Jesus. Well, who's Jesus? Well, like, guess what? Now that uniqueness just was leveled, I can get into a conversation. Because in their country, hardly anybody's heard of Jesus. Heard of Jesus. I, I always use this example, but I have a buddy uh, that does mission work over there. And the way he came to know Jesus, he's working in an office. And someone came in and said, do you know Jesus? And he says, I don't, but I just started working here. Maybe he's down the hall. At the other. <laughs> I mean, like, that, that's, that's Jesus there versus Buddha. Um, and so you leveled, leveraged that. Uh, when we were in... Uh, Kazakhstan, when we ad adopted Emily, she was eight months old when we got her, and we were there for a month. Uh, we're weird. We're really weird there. Um, we, we went to some churches there, because there, it's 4% Protestant. By the way, you're Protestant, okay? But just so you figure that out. Everything else was either unbelievers, uh, Muslim, or Russian Orthodox Catholic, like Catholic extreme jacked up Catholic. And so they knew I was a pastor, um, which this is very weird compared to what they're used to anyways. Uh, and like we would go to churches and like there would be what they call icons, like pictures all over the walls and it goes up a couple, a couple uh, stories and stuff. And you find a picture of Jesus or Mary or whatever you want and you stare at it while the priest walks around in all his robes and his smoke and stuff and he chants and you chant. You chant. No one talks to each other. Uh, no one sits down. And then when he's done, he just kind of stumbles off and everybody leaves. So this is weird. And so, like, with our translator and with our uh, alcoholic driver, uh, <laughs> we had incredible conversations because this is just so different. You can look, and I, I'm hoping next month when I'm in Africa that I'm weird there too. You know, that it just, our uniqueness is once we get out of our hometown, you, God wants to use that for his glory. So that he is using. He just came from Jerusalem. He, he's been with the apostles. Uh, and then the result is right there in eight. So there was much joy in that city. People started following Jesus. They're not following Philip. They're following Jesus. And so there's a result to that. So if you kind of keep that in mind, that's going to help you a little bit when you get outside of marrying people that you know and like. Okay? So Luke is great at doing contrast. So then he introduces another character to give us uh, a different way that that same model is used uh, in verse 9. So, so those Philip, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to call Simon Philip at some point, and I'm going to call Philip Simon at some point. I just, I, I, every time I go through this, I call him the wrong name. So there you go. So, but there was a man named Mary, just kidding, uh, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed at the pe was amazed, the, uh, and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, now listen to what they say. This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. 
Okay, so now we have, we're going to have the, the real thing and the counterfeit of a showman come head to head. If we go back to that same list again, if, see, I told you, I keep Lisa on the toes. This works even if you're not following Christ. This works if you're a false teacher. People mirror this within the world to get people to follow them instead of Christ. They might say Christ, but that's not what their goal is. His message is look at me. It's not look at Jesus, it's look at me. The, everything about it, th this is exactly what his whole practice is. And he does signs. He does signs. And I will tell you this, even with like false teachers, we'll talk about that more later. Satan can do signs. This guy's not doing Satan. This guy's just doing tricks. This guy's the pen and teller of Samaria, right? <laughs> Whichever one wants to be, depends on how much he talks. Um, he, he is doing things to amaze them so that they think that he is great. So like R.C. Spohr, has anybody ever heard of R.C. Spohr? Hey, there we go, there's a couple. He's a theologian, uh, Bible teacher, and I, I've read a story of him one time where he would, uh, him and his buddy would go golfing with other people, and he was a pretty good golfer. Um, and he would take two of those longer like kitchen matches and stick them down the ground behind his ball so you couldn't see them when he's driving, I guess is what you call it, because I've never played golf. Um, and when you drive at the pup butt, they yell at you. But they put the two matches there, and he would hide them, and his other buddy would go, man, watch, watch this. When I'll see, when he hits that ball, it's like lightning, man. It's just, it blows up. And then he, he had a swing down, so he hit it, and those matches would go off. They didn't know they were there. And so that's what he was doing. It, it, it was the magician tricks. And that, with that uniqueness, he leveled that for his own glory. He leveled that. He had a great following. He had a lot of people. A lot of people liked the showman. So much so that they called him great and that they said he had the power of God. And the result was he got followers for himself. He got followers for himself. Do you see the contrast between the two? Okay. Because that's going to come, come pretty important when we see these two things collide. Okay. Now, when we see God do something great, there's always a, I'm not even going to try you guys, result. <laughs> there's got to be a response to whatever God does. When God does something, you either lean into God or you reject God or there's some variations in between, right? We've talked about that. When we had John and Peter in, on fake trial in front of the religious leaders of the time, we've talked about it. If they just leaned into what they said, what the Holy Spirit said through them, how glorious would this moment be? But they rejected them and they beat them and they stoned them. You know what I mean? Like we, we've come against that several times. This time God is going to do something and... We're going to see a different result. Not quite leaning into God, not quite leaning away from it, but something in the middle that I want to explore with you because you'll you experience this as you do ministry. Uh, so here we've got Simon, and in verse 12, we've got the word but. Again, that's a connection word. There's something going to be a conflict here. It says, but when they believed Philip, the people, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized, both men and women, even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So everything you see there at first glance, he's now leaned into God. So this, this should be good news. This should be good news. Um, but let's break down and make sure that we know exactly what Philip is saying and, and what it appears that Simon is, is going with. Um, first off, the good news. When we had VBS here last week, the last night, uh, I got to sit with each age group and talk to them a little bit about the gospel uh, on their different age levels. And it was really kind of a cool thing. We're watching a video before that, and it's talking about the next story of Philip here and how Philip is sharing the good news was, of, of God with, with this person. And so when we sat there, I said, hey, when they said that, what's the good news of, of God? And I'll, I'll tell you what, the kids did better that than you guys just did with the Great Commission. They had some interesting ideas. They, they really did throw out some. It wasn't what I was going for, but they had some really cool things in there. And, um, but I got to share with them, well, the good, good news of Jesus that they are proclaiming over and over again is his new life through him for all of us, that each of us have blown it. Each of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. According to Romans, it, the penalty of sin is death, uh, not just physical death, because that wasn't part of God's original plan, but spiritual death as well. But Jesus, and those are two of the most beautiful words put together, but Jesus came down, lived this life, showed us this life, experienced this life. Uh, uh, him leaving heaven for this cesspool is amazing to me. And then took the cross to pay the penalty for that sin, 
rose again victorious over sin and death so that you and I can have life again. Tons of people believe that. Simon believed that. You guys still with me? And as the old saying goes, all the way back to when I was a kid, you think Facebook came up with it. It didn't. Demons believe it. Satan believes it. Believing it, growing up in church, having nice memories of VBS, grandma and grandpa talking to you about it, reading the Bible frontwards and backwards ten times to the point that you're going to explain a lot better than I'm going to up here on a Sunday morning, is believing it, but it's not accepting Jesus as leader and forgiving your life. And the sad part is, the sad part is, it won't happen until you open up yourself to the Holy Spirit. You can know, I know people that will ask me all kinds of questions about faith. They want to understand faith frontwards and backwards. But until you experience it, you're just not going to get it. I know people that struggle with the head knowledge of it and look at it. And it, it doesn't really make sense because God doesn't make sense because he thinks different than we do. But yet they've had an experience in their life, or a few experiences in their life, or a season in their life that can only be explained by the Holy Spirit. So they can't completely deny it. But yet they still struggle with the leaning into for the fullness of it. I'm going to put out an argument that I don't think Simon accepted Jesus as leader and forgiver in his life. He believed. He believed. But I don't think he accepted him. He got baptized. And baptism's good. Baptism's real good. Right? As a matter of fact, uh, da, 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 da. Raylan is getting baptized on June 14th. That's applause. July. 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 You missed it. It was great. No. <laughs> July 14th, unless it's changed, because we're still looking at some schedule things. Uh, baptism is what you do to fulfill the righteousness. Now, different people are going to have different views. I'm more than happy to have any conversations afterwards, but I'm already going to talk long today so we can fight about it later. Uh, I do not believe that you are saved at baptism. You are saved when you accept Jesus as leader and forgive in your life. But to be a Christ follower, you get baptized. Because Jesus himself said, I must be baptized because this is, fulfills all righteousness. When I do this, everybody around me knows that Jesus has forgiven me. When I go in that water and I come up boist, that water touched every crevice of my body, just like grace covered every crevice of my sin. And I go down, and it's this beautiful, tangible, like Jesus, that I die to myself, and I come back with a new life. And the awesome thing is the new life is the life that he wanted for you in the get-go. Get before we walk through. And he got baptized. Now, if you've not been baptized and you've accepted Jesus' lead and forgiven your life, which a lot of times happens July 14th, we'd love to talk to you some more and love to get you in on that. Some people ask me, when do you do baptism so I know? Whenever anybody says, I want to get baptized. Okay? Raylan's on it. I love him. And if you want to jump in on that, great. If not, we'll do it the next week if you want to do it then. Okay. So he does the belief. He does baptism. After that is other believers. It's important to be part of a local body, to have brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't see all, everybody in Samaria go, this is awesome. I'm going to go to my house and watch Netflix. We're together. We're sharing. We're open with each other. We're, we're laughing together. We're crying together. We're lamenting together. We're worshiping together. There's other believers there. Uh, part of that, and this, this is scary to talk about because it depends on your background, whether or not you have a healthy experience in this or not, is being a member of a local body church, not a member like a country club member, the churches I grew up in, if I become a member, I get a key and a vote. That's not what membership is biblically. It's a member of the, the, the family, a member of the body, a member of the mission is, is what that comes into. Uh, Rich, if I'm going to call out Raylan, Brent became a member of TSF this week. Yay, Brent. Oh, I woke Brent up. Uh, no, it's good. <laughs> but congratulations. Oh, thrilled. That was the meeting right after Java. We were kind of finishing up questions. Uh, a lot of you guys also, by the way, wanted to go through the video series and never, never touch base with me again. Come on, people. We commit him. Okay. And so then after we have believers, it's being. He's fo the, the, the being like Philip, following Philip, doing that, that same thing that's here. So it looks good here, but there's a little bit of a hint at the bottom of 13 that seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. That hints that there might be a problem. Because that that's really hints at emotional Christianity, and Christianity is just much more than emotion. God's not good just when things are going great. You know what I mean? So we got a little problem. But first they do a sidebar, verse 14. The apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria was having, received the word of God, so this is a great revival. And they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had been only baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So again, things are going good, so much so that the hometown hears about it, and they send them their big dogs, right? Peter and John, there's, you can't get much higher than that when it comes to the apostles. You got two guys that are running with each other to the grave. You have, have them right there at Pentecost. You have Peter, the cornerstone. You got John, the, the, the apostle that Jesus loved. I mean, the, the top brass is coming down. And I want to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. They are still struggling with their prejudice against Samaritans. We're going to see that in, in a few chapters. But they know they're to go to Samaria. They know that God is moving there. And so they're going to be faithful, even though they're uncomfortable. And so they, they go in, into th this town and they're, they're laying uh, hands on them so they receive the Holy Spirit because, again, if the apostles need the Holy Spirit, we need the Holy Spirit to be able to do this mission. <laughs> and we see Simon's heart revealed. Verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So his heart's revealed. Once again, why does he want this power to be able to lay on people so that they get the Holy Spirit? Because that's where the attention's at. This is how he gets his gig back. This is how the showman gets to be back up into the fun. And so he's willing to offer money. God doesn't work that way. I thank God Almighty, after all the, ch the churches I've been in growing up, that only once in all 20 years has someone said to me, I want to do whatever I want because I give the church a bunch of money. Keep your money. That's not how things work. We follow the spirit here. We follow the elders here. Um, this, this, that's kind of the mentality that, that Simon hears. And it, I mean, uh, yeah, that Simon has. And then Peter, Simon Peter, hey, I can call him and do anything I want to there. Uh, calls him out for it. And he calls out his bitter, bitterness. He talks about his iniquity that he's having with. And uh, then Simon has, I guess this is the closest thing we're going to see to uh, Scrooge in the Christmas kill in the Bible when he sees what the future looks like, or he gets revealed to him what his present is from the ghost of whatever p present or past, tell me that the, I can change this. Save me from this. But do you know, if I look at this, honestly, if you look at Saucy, I don't know if he repented still. I still don't know if he said, I pray that he did. But what I see here is a guy that believes that is now scared, and Peter, you pray so that I can be saved. That I, that I don't have to go through this hardship or, the, or this thing that you've spoken against me. I don't know if he ever got saved. I really pray he did. I pray that he did because we end up having struggles uh, when we're doing it on our own or for our own purposes. Um, I think I got a list in there of just kind of highlights that I want to give to you that might stand out as you're moving outside your comfort zone to the people that you're comfortable with. Uh, first off, and this is an important point to hear, you must leave hometown. If you're a Christian and minister of the word of Jesus Christ, again, the, the commission is for all of us. And so we must be able to trust God and be un outside of our comfort zone to be able to leave us. That does not mean you need to plan a trip to wherever, Colorado or something, on some kind of mission team uh, by the end of this month. It's just that you need to follow the Spirit as he leads. And you need to, well, let's go back to the message one. I think it's the next slide. And we need to be able to do it properly with the message of Jesus Christ, by doing things that back it up so that they have a reason to believe us in the first place, leveling your uniqueness and wherever God calls you to, and then the result being the kingdom, the kingdom growing and other people knowing Jesus Christ. So if you think, well, that's for somebody else to do, he will get you out of that comfort zone sooner or later. Okay, back to the other ones. Uh, another thing, it must be sincere. It cannot be fake. Fake always fails. Simon was doomed from the beginning. Doomed from the beginning. Uh, people will be fake for a while, and God will get to them sooner or later because he's a jealous God, and he wants better for them, and he wants better for others. The sad part is a lot of people will be hurt in the meantime. When you have a fake pastor, you've got fake televangelists, whatever, people will be hurt by that when they're exposed. Um, that's the part that we need to be bringing the will uh, to. And uh, it is bountiful. It's bountiful. If you've not been watching, uh, and I, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'll make somebody mad. 
Maybe I'll make Katie mad. <laughs> no, but um, I don't think so because no one talked to me, and I, I brought this up a couple of weeks ago, but like Benny Hinn right now uh, is a great example of falsehood being exposed in a major, major way. Uh, there's a guy named Mike Weaver who's an uh, online uh, Bible teacher that I like quite a bit. Uh, I don't agree with everything he says. I don't think I agree with everybody, anything everybody says. I don't think there's anybody out in the world who agrees with everything I say. That I always take it back to Scripture. But he did a massive deep dive on Benny Hinn's ministry and did uh, like a four and a half hour uh, study on that with video, with examples and stuff. Uh, so if you love Benny Hinn, you think I'm a joke for bringing him up, uh, let me know. I'd love to send you that link before we talk. Uh, then Benny Hinn's nephew, who is uh, worked with Benny Hinn's ministries behind the scenes for a very long period of time, still loves his uncle but couldn't do it anymore, uh, has come out after watching Mike's and says, everything you've seen from a distance is 100% true behind the scenes. Uh, there's another podcast where they meet for the first time and sit and talk. Uh, that's, in, that's, that's incredible. Falsehood has to be exposed because it's hurting people. Um, and right now we're in a season, if, if you've not gone through the sermon uh, Bad Churches that I did last year, it's on our YouTube page. Uh, there's five categories of churches that I think are Jesus is about to spank. Uh, and unfortunately they make up the majority of the church in the country. Um, the, there's a lot of examples, and I think we're in a season where he's already spanking, um, whether it be Mark Driscoll. Um, I think it's coming for Joel Osteen, and you can get mad at me for that one. We can talk about that more if you'd like. Uh, but don't, don't cheer me on. Let him be mad at me, not you. Um, but I'm, I'm honestly saying this as your shepherd. I'm not saying this just to name names. Um, J- uh, J- Josh McDowell? No. J- John MacArthur? No. What is his name? Let me get his name. James, yeah, James McDonald, Rob Bell, uh, Todd Bentley, all these guys have been knocked out and have started things up again and have followers again. Um, there are some that I think have started with the right purposes, but they get lost in the system. They get lost in the system and they start doing stupid things just because they want more and more people. Uh, please, uh, if, if you, you put up with me so far, that lead pastor from Bethel, please don't. Uh, Bethel's got some good music, uh, very new agey teachings. Uh, and oh gosh, I'm going to bug. I know I'll bug somebody on this one, but Stephen Fortick, keep an eye on. Uh, stop it. Let them be mad at me. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, and I'm not happy to talk about those things. But here's the thing we always think about that with pastors, but the fact is we're all ministers and it happens with you too. When. I was 23, and you get, most of you guys know this testimony, but when I was 23 and I was up for a youth pastor job and I was taking people to church and I was telling people about Jesus, and I had probably one of the most vibrant ministries of my life, but yet I was stealing money from the place I worked at, and God said, listen, it's 100% or nothing, dude. He finally had to lay me out on that, and I lost everything, everything, because God loves us enough. When he lays out, we'll talk about this in a little bit, in a couple of weeks, he lays out Saul to make him look up. He will lay you out to make you look up. It's just the people we hurt in the meantime. So we, we have to make sure that we know falsehood will be exposed, but only things that the Lord stand. And then legit is awesome. Legit is awesome. <laughs> Whenever you see the legitimate move of Christ, it's awesome. Look at verse 25. Uh, now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. They have a massive revival. They're going back to Jerusalem, and they're hitting all the towns in between. They're saying, guess what? Jesus is for you too. It is a beautiful, awesome story. And if you open yourself up to it, why my heart goes out to Simon, there are communities changed here. There are families changed here. There are couples changed here. There are individuals changed here. This is massive freedom, which is what Jesus Christ does when we lean into him. He does it, and we either get to reject it, or we get to lean into it. The middle ground Simon already showed us doesn't work. We either lean into it for the fullness of what he has, or we just let things fall, fall apart. But it has to be the spirit. The head knowledge will not get you very far. The head knowledge comes afterwards so that we can live a life of freedom and stop going in the ditch.